This is the story of how a small band of committed enthusiasts saved one of Britain's greatest achievements, its network of canals. A network that had been built by hand in the years after 1760. Canals had been the lifeblood of the early Industrial Revolution in a golden age that lasted until the end of the 19th century. During the 20th century, they declined, and after World War II, many became threatened with closure. But a campaign begun in the 1940s by just a few people grew into a spirited movement that fought and ultimately won the campaign to save the network. Some of those campaigners filmed their exploits. Their home movies show how they worked, sometimes with bare hands, to help rescue the inland waterways and deliver the canals into a second golden age. Barry Argent's got canals in his blood. And one behind his house. Morning, Barry. You want to take over? This morning, he's on a boat with his mate Jeff can't use his own. It's in two halves at the bottom of his garden. The amount of work I've done on this, it's phenomenal. And virtually I've rebuilt the boat. I got a chance of obviously buying one myself. Uh, well, I hadn't got a chance because I ain't got two pennies to rub together. I borrowed money from here, there and everywhere and bought a boat. And I learnt to weld. And uh, put a cabin on it, put the engine in it. Took the engine out, put another engine in it. I just loved doing it. I could work in here all night long and not think note on it, but I don't because of the neighbours. Many a time the wife's coming out to tell me it's time to go to bed, Barry. You know, because uh, time means nothing to me when I'm enjoying myself and that's it. Right. Barry comes from a long tradition of boating families. His father and mother worked on the canals before the war. Coming out of the church now, that's my mum. Uh, just coming out, that's my dad. It's quite unusual to see my dad in these films, actually. He obviously got somebody else to, sh to shoot this, because normally he's taking the film. I don't even know why he got into films. He lived, slept, eat, drank, everything, canals and boats. What he didn't know wasn't worth knowing. Barry's parents were part of a tradition that stretched back to the middle of the 19th century. Britain's first significant canal, the Bridgewater Canal, was built to take coal from Lancashire into Manchester. It was opened in 1761. Then, 
in a frenzy of building, canals spread across the country. By the middle of the 1830s, a network linking all Britain's major industrial towns and cities had been largely completed. Fed by rivers or reservoirs, canals became the lifeblood of the Industrial Revolution. I don't think the Industrial Revolution could have happened without canals. I think one of the key things the canals did was actually make a route into a city. And if you think of a city that is running purely on horsepower, where everything is horse and cart, and how little a horse can carry, but when the canals were built, you get one horse bringing 25 or 50 tonnes in it a go, suddenly the whole Industrial Revolution could take off. By the beginning of the 20th century, more than 50,000 people worked on the boats, carrying more than 36 million tonnes each year. In 1930, Barry Argent's father began working for one of the canal carrying companies, Fellows, Morton and Clayton. Fellows, Morton and Clayton were one of the largest canal carrying companies of their time. They actually carried virtually everything. I mean, typically they carried a lot of tea for Thai food for Birmingham. They carried tomato puree for HP sauce um, and they brought finished goods back. They actually carried a lot of foodstuffs. They carried even things like ice for boots. Uh, so, I mean, it was, you, you name it, they carried it really. And like I say, they used to work the boats together. They worked for fellas Morton Clayton's. Their week's work, they used to run from Langley Mill down to Wembley with coal, unload at Wembley, come back to Langley Mill, load again, and go back to Watford Gap. And that was their week's work. And uh, my dad says it was bloody hard work. Barry's parents were typical. Many wives lived and worked alongside their husbands and home was the tiny cabin at the back of the boat. All canal boats needed two people to work them. In the early days, you needed, um, they were horse-drawn boats, you needed somebody to drive the horse and somebody to steer the boat. When canals were profitable, that's fine. A man, usually a man, would be captain of the boat and he'd employ a crew, and it could be a lad, could be a couple of blokes. But when things got really tight, and particularly uh, we think in the 1840s, when railway competition became much more extreme, rates were cut, the canals were no longer so profitable, and of course it made sense with a little cabin on the back for the man to take his wife along. And of course, men, women, cabins, soon children, and a whole population is developing. This was how Joe Hollingshead lived as a child on a working boat on the Birmingham Canal Navigation. In a little cabin like that, my dad had three of us. We was very cramped, but when we got like a load in the boat, like that boat's loft up there, if you got a load of flour on or a load of sugar on, we used to make our bed in there and it used to be lovely. They used to take it in turns, mum and dad sleeping on the boat while they were travelling along. Thus they worked day and night. Sometimes they never even stopped the engine because as soon as they got there and that's when they used to send us to school. As many a time we went in school at Birmingham, just they used to tell us we've got to go to school. We was only in an hour and back out again. So we learnt nothing in that hour. My mother used to do all the cooking and all the baking and the apple pies was beautiful and the bread pudding. But I don't know how she done it because it was very hard work in a little place like that and got to do the washing. There was no washing machines. It all got to be done by hand. So it was a very hard job for her. This world of Joe and Barry's parents was slowly disappearing. During the 1930s, 
Canals face stiff competition from the roads. As trade declined, the numbers of working boat families fell steadily, and many of the canals themselves were left neglected. Then, in 1938, an engineer, Tom Rolt, bought a converted working narrowboat. He and his wife spent 18 months traveling on Cressy through the inland waterways in the Midlands. The lives of the working boat people that he witnessed became the spark that ignited a 30-year campaign to rescue Britain's ailing canals. He did think something major had been lost. And he saw, he felt he saw, when he saw people on narrow boats, Midlands narrow boats in particular, that he was seeing something of a previous civilization. Cultures that had survived through the Industrial Revolution. Tom Rold spent the early years of the war writing an account of his time on the canals. Narrow Boat was published in 1944. It captured the imagination of thousands, including a writer, Robert Aikman. An impetuous man by nature, Aikman was concerned that the narrow canals could disappear altogether. He raced up from London to meet Tom Rold at Tardybeg on the Worcester and Birmingham Canal. They really liked each other a lot and um, agreed that it would be a very good thing to form some sort of campaigning body to fight for the revival of the canals. The Inland Waterways Association was launched in February 1946 with the head office in Robert Aikman's London flat. They had little money but needed an assistant. I had left my first husband and I didn't approve of women, healthy women, taking money off men because they didn't want to live with them anymore, so I didn't have any money. And I had to start earning some, and I had half-written novel. I had no idea that anybody would publish it. So I did all kinds of jobs, you know, modelling for Vogue. I did a certain amount of broadcasting. I'd done it all through the war, continuity announcing and things. And Robert and Ray offered me this job for two, a two pounds ten a week. I went three mornings a week, I think, or three days, really, and I, I worked very hard for my money. War and neglect had left Britain's canal network in a poor state. The campaigners had two goals, to stop the government closing canals and to persuade it to spend money to restore those that were being left to die. One of the chief ways in which the Inland Waterways Association saw that it could campaign for the improvement of the canals was by demonstrating that you could actually go along them in a boat. Many of them were, of course, very run down at this time, uh, virtually derelict, but nevertheless, they were still supposed to be open for navigation. It was required statutorily that a boat should be allowed to go along them. Aikman chose one of the most run-down canals in the country to illustrate just how dilapidated the system had become. In the summer of 1948, he invited Tom Rolt to join him on an expedition to the Huddersfield Canal. Rolt brought along his wife, Angela, Aikman, his secretary, Jane. She apparently was extremely attractive woman in those days, outstandingly beautiful. Robert Aikman said of her that when Jane walks in the room, the whole world seems to come to a halt. And it did for him, certainly. He obviously fell very much um, under her spell. I think H.G. Wells is quite right about that. It doesn't matter what a man looks like as long as he can talk. And he was very good at talking. The group couldn't have chosen a more difficult waterway. 
the Huddersfield Canal had not been used since 1939. With most of its locks out of action, it was almost unnavigable. Aikman hired a cruiser, Ailsa Craig, for the adventure. The journey in Ailsa Craig had many ups and downs, I have to say. Our plan was to go across the Pennines in the Huddersfield Narrow Canal, which had 72 locks in 19 miles, I think. Rather a lot of them. It was a real struggle. There's, there's no question it wasn't, you know, this wasn't a picnic at all, going out on a nice leisure boating holiday. And after they had struggled through the locks, they confronted the entrance to the Stanage Tunnel. At more than three miles, it was once the longest canal tunnel in the world. No pleasure boat had been through it since 1939. The party was cruising into the unknown. It was a real struggle getting through. Um, completely dark, of course. No lighting at all. Several times the boat got stuck. The railway line ran alongside it. But that meant that when you were in the tunnel, every now and then a, a, an express roared through and the tunnel was full of smoke. And that was, you know, it didn't clear very quickly. Various times when they were completely stuck, Tom Rolt went crawling along the roof and tore off bits of the side of the boat in order to ease its passage through. On another occasion, put the engine full steam ahead and simply charged and managed to sort of crash through. It was a really hazardous journey and it took about five hours instead of what should have been just over an hour to pass through in the normal way. But they did finally make it. We, we were the last people to go through it for a very long time, until was very recently, really. So I enjoyed that enormously. While Jane and Robert Aikman enjoyed the adventure, Tom Rolt thought it had been reckless. The escapade saw the beginnings of a rift between the two men, a rift that became irreparable when the two fell out over Rolt's idea for a national rally of boats. The rally was planned for August 1950, here in Market Harborough. Yes, th this would have been the view that we saw when we first arrived here. Coming in through the Narrows to a, a basin that was absolutely packed with boats. There was only just room to turn our full length boat around. We went back to the first available slot we could tie into, which was um, almost half a mile out of the town and more boats came after us, so that uh, there was this long line of boats along the towpath. And the other thing that amazed us was the crowds of people. All through the day, it was almost impossible to try and get in a hurry along the towpath, because you were just, it was stolid people. It really created a stir in the town. All seemed to be going well, but the planning for it had exposed the increasing tensions between Rolt and Aikman. Well, he wasn't like anybody else. Uh, he was very clever, very neurotic, paranoid really, very manipulative, 
he got his own way, one way or another, pretty well all the time. And of course, um, wanting wanted to be the centre of the scene. And Tom, who I don't think particularly wanted to be the centre, but he wanted to be a, a partner. And they didn't agree on methods. They argued bitterly about the purpose of the rally. Tom felt that it should be about the boats and the canal, and Robert felt this was a chance to demonstrate, if you like, that the canals as part of a centre of a, a different sort of cultural life. Very elitist, by the way. This was not some sort of idea of a plebeian, a popular culture for one moment. It was a chance to create something that he thought was dis recreate something that he thought was disappearing, really, in what they saw as a rather sort of gaunt, uh, flat, state-dominated um, post-war era. Aikman wanted a festival. He'd planned performances, film shows, and even a pageant. Not at all what Rolt had envisaged. Tom protested about the Market Harbour rally, because he said, you've taken up my idea, in effect. And Robert wrote to say, well, I don't think you should come. Uh, I don't think you should come at all. But Rolt went anyway, as did 50,000 visitors. The event took place over several days, um, and on almost every day, uh, they were running public trips. The grand finale was a parade of the boats, um, led by uh, the, the, this uh, slipper launch uh, with the Carnival Queen and a few dignitaries on board. The festival was a huge success. It showed there was a public appetite for canals, but it also exposed fundamental differences between Tom Rolt who was interested mainly in working boats, and Robert Aikman, who wanted to save every mile of canal. Aikman won the day. In 1952, Tom Rolt was expelled from the IWA. After the success of Market Harborough, membership of the association grew quickly. But the 1950s were difficult years. Canals were seen as essentially working waterways, and working traffic was falling sharply. The IWA policy, Save Every Mile, was rejected by the government body that owned most canals. The remit of the British Transport Commission was about transport. It was nothing to do with amenities, nothing to do with developing tourism, uh, except in very minor ways. So as far as they were concerned, rather like beaching later on, um, if it wasn't going to, it didn't have a long-term future, you got rid of it. But getting rid of a canal was difficult. They had been set up by individual acts of parliament. So when the British Transport Commission tried to abandon one, campaigners would descend on it in a mass protest cruise and insist on their legal right of navigation. It led to a decade of conflict. Tom Chaplin remembers how he got involved in his teens. Back in the mid-60s, a friend of mine was editor of the IWA Bulletin. And I remember one time I, I, I was with him and he said, uh, we've just heard the Leeds and Liverpool might be under threat. So um, the next weekend we jumped in his little Hillman Husky with a tent and we camped on the moors overnight and we actually went and looked at the, the Leeds and Liverpool and took lots of photos and wrote up about it. And the following summer uh, they held a rally there. Boats came from north, south, east and west and that, that was publicity, show British waterways that people wanted it and it was a way of changing public opinion. Because what is difficult to remember now is that if you said to somebody in the 50s or the 60s, I'm going on a canal holiday, this stinking ditch, dead dogs, that's how they looked at it. And, and a lot of people wanted local canals shut because they felt it was somewhere where the kids drowned. These protest cruises went on through the 1950s until matters came to a head in 1962. A national protest rally was planned in Stourbridge. Don Gray was there. 
Well, in the late 50s, the traffic had ceased. This, that's the commercial traffic. Um, looking towards Stourbridge, this was largely overgrown. Then you couldn't get any further. The whole place just looked a mess. Further along the canal, perhaps half a mile from here, you could walk across the canal. There, it was literally completely silted up, which was why the National Rally organisers decided to have the event here and force the issue for keeping it open to navigation. The only way they could hold the protest rally was by dredging the canal, but the British Transport Commission refused permission and threatened to prosecute anyone who even touched the water. Neither side was prepared to back down. The person who really got most heavily involved was from the Midlands branch of the Inland Waterways Association, and that was David Hutchings. David Hutchings went out and took action. There was direct action, uh, and he was very keen on publicity and also very keen on doing something which would associate with the 60s, which actually was about really breaking the law when you know you're on the right side. You couldn't get up this canal because it was full of silt. And David Hutchings hired a little drag line. And he put the drag line on the towpath and he scooped up enough mud so the boats could get to Starbridge, the Starbridge Arm. And he was told he wasn't meant to and he just did it. <laughs> and a hundred or so boats turned up at Starbridge. The atmosphere here was electric. David had taken on Goliath and won. We'd achieved national press. All, all the London dailies were carrying this on the front pages. And people came to see what it was all about. We, we thought it was an absolutely wonderful weekend. The 1962 victory at Stourbridge duly took its place in the roll call of IWA successes. But one of the long-term aims bringing back working traffic wasn't so successful. So, put the ignition on. That's the ignition key there. Put it on heat for about 10 seconds. Right. That yellow light will come on. And then you can turn the engine over it. And then it'll flip back to the ignition right. position. <coughs> and then you're ready to go. Okay. Right, OK. And the steering, if you... Pull the, push the steer, uh, yeah. tell the bar this way. Yeah, that's, that's a familiar one, but I haven't been on, haven't sat, sat, stood on the back, back of a boat of this for a long time, actually. So, yeah. As I recall, it was the same summer that Elvis died. Joseph Bowie's returning to the place he came first with his parents in the early 1960s. Well, it's a long time ago, but I'm obviously very, very nervous. I wasn't very mechanically minded, I'm not now. And I, and I can see I'm holding onto this thing, thinking, what am I supposed to do? I hadn't been allowed to be at the tiller. Um, and Father, I can see, is actually sort of holding on, really. If you start messing it up, um, I'm, going to, I'm there. I'm there to pick it all up if, if things start to go wrong. Um, there's a lot in that shot. When he came here as a child in 1963, his father filmed a moment that captured the changing character of the canal network. As it happened, he managed to um, film something which was a piece of history. While he was here, a working boat came by. At the time, actually, there were quite a lot of boats on this, on this canal. It's the only one that he filmed in detail. but it is a different world. There, standing on the back of the boat with his expensive camera, is my father, um, fairly, fairly well-off professional, and there on the boat is somebody um, who had been born on a boat, who had spent, would expected to spend most of their life on the boat. And at that time, living in on boats, not actually people using now a boat, living in on boats as part of your lifestyle was coming to an end.
But just as that life was drawing to a close, a new way of using the waterways was replacing it. Well, it is a long time since we've been down here, isn't it? It is. When do you reckon it was? 60? Oh, September 1961, when we brought the Margaret across and made the film. Yeah. Harry Arnold and his longtime friend, Eddie Frangleton, are retracing a journey on the canal to Langlochlin. When they came here half a century ago, they were pioneers, taking part in a new, and in those days, highly unusual holiday, a boat hostel holiday. Eddie thought it so unusual, he brought his film camera with him. Of all the trips, I think it was probably the, uh, the icing on the cake. I just try to convey to other people the sense of comradeship and togetherness and the whole atmosphere which surrounded the canals. I know I let Harry on odd occasion film, doing a little bit Alfred Hitchcock appearance on my films. Well, the whole ethos of the company was that um, the boat itself would be horse-drawn perpetuate the old ways, um, nothing to do with diesel engines. The first hotel boats really started on the canals just after the war. Uh, people who had been trying to carry cargo on their own, for their own company as it were, decided that they just couldn't make a living at it. It was just impossible. There wasn't enough money to be made and there still isn't out of carrying on the canals. But they were they enthusiasts, so they wanted to carry. They wanted to be on the boats and, and carry on the canals. So what they did, they decided that if they couldn't carry cargo, they'd carry people. And that was a very strange idea to do because people weren't allowed on the canals. It wasn't a place where the, the public could be. It was just like a you know walking along a railway nowadays. You don't do it. So they were offering them these holidays in a strange environment, an adventure type holiday, and people lapped it up. The makeup of the hostel boat was, uh, as far in crew terms, it had a skipper and an assistant who was generally a student and a cook, and it ran exactly as a youth hostel did, only afloat, in the fact you helped with the peeling of the potatoes and washing up and so on, and you got a very cheap holiday. And because they were heading for Langothlan, they got to see perhaps the most impressive piece of architecture on the whole network, the aqueduct at Ponce Select. They weren't disappointed. The aqueduct is one of the seven wonders of the world, right, of, of the canal world. And so one of my ambitions was to cross this aqueduct, and it didn't let us down. It was absolutely staggering. I was totally unprepared for the fact that on the offside there was no railing, it was a sheer drop down. I thought it was magical. People loved it because it was a holiday you couldn't get anywhere else. It was totally new to them and people did come in large numbers. They could fill as many boats as people could, could get.
For a few years, this new generation of pleasure boaters shared the canals with working boats. They were able to catch a glimpse of the culture that was disappearing and many wanted to capture part of that culture for themselves. Part of the attraction of canal boating, definitely an important part of the, of the attraction, was the traditional painting and the roses and castles. It's a tradition that Tony Lurie is keen to maintain. Well, I suppose my whole approach to canal boat painting has been to try and do it, obviously, as well as I can, but within the within the tradition, as I understand it, within the tradition of the, the old work that I've seen and, and try not to let it get um, you know, carried away with modern <laughs> alterations or improvements. I do think it's an important survivor. It's believed the tradition began when women came onto the canals in the 1840s. Artisan painters decorated boats and cabin interiors elaborately and the distinctive style became known as roses and castles. Roses are not a big problem in the sense of looking for origins. Flowers generally are the most commonly used decorative device on anything you want to sell, I mean, any commercial thing. Castle pictures are a, a bit different. I always think it makes a bit more sense to think of it as roses and landscapes because although a lot of the buildings are quite castle-like, the, um, yeah, some of them are really quite domestic as well. If you think about just as a decorative, pretty landscape, that's far more understandable, really. Here's a, here's a typical piece of canal boat art. I mean, really, one of the classics. This is a, a block that rests on the, on the cabin roof to support the end of the gangplank and faces back down so you see it all day. A classy piece of work by Frank Nurser, who is one of the very best-known painters uh, from Braunston in the Midlands. But it's got all the regular ingredients. It's got, yes, it's a castle in the sense that it's got round towers, but it's also got these really quite domestic roofs and, and highlights. But more important than that, it is the fact that it is a landscape. It is a picture of a relaxed, gentle place. And I think the idea of the landscape is as much, uh, of the, as much importance as being the castle. It's sometimes been said that really it's the roses and castles tradition of the narrowboats that save the canals. And I do sometimes wonder, it's such an attractive tradition that it had a, an enormous impact really on the new people coming into, into the canals. And without this tradition, I wonder if they would have been so interested if the boats hadn't been such, so attractive in themselves. Whatever the attraction, by the middle of the 60s, there were thousands of people using the waterways. Though a policy of neglect and disablement had left many of the canals themselves unusable. Until now, the campaign had focused on keeping canals open, but local societies began to demand the right to restore derelict canals. For years, they met firm opposition from British waterways. But in 1964, here at Stourbridge, where just two years before there had been a total standoff, there was now a change of heart, a result of a local grassroots initiative. Well, before this started and, and became a success, it, it was a bit like um, trench warfare. The, uh, the, the enthusiasts would throw verbal brickbats at British waterways who would neatly deflect them. And uh, this got people, in a way, out of their slit trenches and in, onto common ground. David Tomlinson was a member of the local Canal Society that approached British Waterways and persuaded it to change its attitude. And for the very first time, work alongside volunteers. The agreement, forged by people on the ground, was a huge step forward and would, over the next 30 years, help transform the network. 
when we first started, we, we cleared um, a certain amount of brushwood and scrub, etc., etc., cleaned out the, the by wash channels so that bricks and rubbish were removed, and then we started on cleaning out the locks, which was a principal uh, obstacle to navigation apart from the decrepit lock gates was the amount of rubbish that had been deposited in the bottom of the locks and we found, I think we found some ammunition from World War II in, in Lock 3 and which we took up to the local police station for their collection and we found all sorts of other things, bicycle wheels and general household rubbish, oil drums, anything that could be chucked in generally seemed to have been chucked in apart from we didn't find a body. We, we always sort of lived in hope we might find a body which would be quite interesting. Well, might be. You know, murder mystery on the Starbridge Canal, but that never happened. David even filmed some of the work of the volunteers during the three years it took to restore the canal. That's him laying bricks in a weir. The process was, I suppose, really, to depending what was on, because obviously you couldn't film everything, but I concentrated uh, on the locks, because the fitting of the lock gates was, uh, was quite interesting to me. And, uh, of course, it was a golden opportunity for the volunteers to, to, to do something that they could go away and feel, well, I've really made my mark there. Not that the volunteers needed much motivation. I haven't myself met very many people who said, oh, I got involved in restoration so I could take my own personal boat through. It was caring about some aspect of the environment, of feeling, if that is lost, something of me is lost. And they came from all walks of life. A lot of people were from um, professional backgrounds. Quite a few people I've met came from clerical jobs, which were pen-pushing, as it were, that's their sort of feeling, um, and didn't provide the satisfaction of working with your hands. Um, the, uh, almost like a sort of dignity of manual labour. You're doing something real. During the day, you're, you're pushing paper around at the end, of the, the end of your career. You're not quite sure what you've actually achieved. You can go past that lock and see the brickwork that you helped to set or see something that you cleared, something you worked on. I think that's a, that's a big motivator. And I think for many people, this was um, a, a serious way of having an awful lot of fun. After three years of serious fun, the canal was reopened in May 1967. The political driving force that enabled it to happen was Barbara Castle, herself something of a canal enthusiast. When Barbara Castle was Minister of Transport, she automatically had the canals under her, uh, in, in her department. Um, but she saw them a bit differently. She saw that they were not just a transport artery, there was a big future for leisure and tourism. And, uh, and because of that, the 1968 Transport Act uh, came into being. And that divided the canals into those that were for transport, like the, the Air and Calder, the River Weaver and so on. Uh, and the rest of the canals, the smaller canals, were seen as cruiseways. This new word appeared, cruiseways. So they were to be developed for leisure and tourism. Barbara Castle came in at the right time, at the start of 1966. What made it so important that she was Minister of Transport rather than someone else was that, not that she initiated policy, but that at the crucial moment she said no, we're not having um, a major cutbacks in, in expenditure on this when the Treasury wanted to basically close the whole system down. Barbara Castle's 1968 Transport Act gave the canals for the first time in more than a century a secure future. Local canal groups became increasingly bold and launched ambitious programmes of restoration. They were encouraged by a growing interest in the environment and Britain's industrial heritage. 
One element of that heritage, the working boat, was almost dead. In 1970, Willow Wren, the last remaining narrowboat coal carrier, ended trading. But a group of canal enthusiasts in the Midlands was determined to keep the tradition alive. Although canal carrying on a grand scale finished in the early 60s and petered off into the 1970s, there have always been a crowd of nutters like us that have, that have kept old boats alive. We like to think that we were doing things properly and preserving a little bit of the past for the future, I suppose. They went about preserving the past by doing it themselves, carrying cargo. They were called Midland Canal Transport. We used to boat together and we were interested in the same subject and we decided, well, let's use the name Midland Canal Transport um, and uh, if we can carry, we'll carry. Uh, and we were quite reasonably successful. We all painted our three boats up in, uh, in the same style with nicely lettered cabins and, uh, and got the boats in the best of order and then went off looking for people who wanted things carrying from here to there. And they filmed it all. It was just a way of recording the odd little um, method for getting along with that little bit quicker or again sort of preserving a little bit of history for the future. Our first traffic was to a group of houses at Kinver near Kidderminster and these three houses had got no road access but they'd all got coal-fired central heating so they all needed about three tonnes of coal each. There was a lot of shoveling to do and a lot of weighing and bagging and humping off so uh, it took all three of us and uh, on a very hot summer's day, humping 19 tonnes of coal, it's hard work. So we were happy to load one of our boats on a uh, Friday, um, boat it over the weekend and deliver it to these people. On the way down, we used to start bagging up, you see. We'd get in the boat's bottom with a shovel and have the way the scales on the, on the beam and we bagged and weighed, you see, as we went down. And then take off the boat and put them on the bank. And then from there on, it was the customer's responsibility to see, you know, get rid of the rest and we had a very good party with them. They would help us get the coal off and they would give us tea and cakes and uh, a bit of money changed hands and it was a very good arrangement and that went on for many years. When you see the film, it reminds you of saying 25, 30 years ago, how much younger we all were. It brings back some, I suppose, some very pleasant memories. Um, odd little moments when perhaps you forget that how we toiled, how we struggled at times. What drove them, like so many volunteers, was a passion to keep a tradition alive. We'd like to think that we did it in a proper manner. Um, as, as the way it would have been, as the way it had evolved over the you know, last two centuries, really. This was our way of using the canals for which they were designed uh, and keeping the channel clear and putting something back into the canal system which, which seemed the right thing for us to do.
I'm afraid Middle Canal Transport suffered from old age, really. Um, one by one, we, we became slightly unsound. Keith had a back problem, Bob had an operation, and I had an operation. And uh, we, we did find other interests, I have to say. Bob found Morgan cars, I found horses. Keith had perhaps got a bit too old to jump on and off boats. So we had our, kept our boats for a while, but then we realised that things had to change. It wasn't that we had enough, but uh, I think, you know, you, as you get a bit older, you think, oh, there are other things to do. Well, that photograph uh, was taken in 1979. We were all looking rather youthful in those days, weren't we? But um, that picture appeared in the local magazine and uh, it's a reminder, perhaps, of the happy days when we were boating and carrying cargo up and down the, the Stourbridge Canal. At the time Tony and his friends were working the Midlands waterways, another group were planning perhaps the most ambitious restoration campaign to date, to restore the Huddersfield Canal, the impossible restoration. Trevor Ellis was a member of the Canal Society at the time. This was the canal that Robert Aikman and his friends had just about negotiated in 1948. To stop pleasure boaters using it after them, British waterways had effectively destroyed it. For myself, I was a local and, uh, you know, ever since I was a child, I'd seen the canal derelict and, uh, you know, wondered about it and what it had been like when it was working and uh, really wanted to do something about it from that angle. That's Trevor in red in a film about the restoration made by one of the Canal Society members. On the films, I obviously look considerably younger than I do now, you know, certainly a lot less grey. Uh... It was probably the restoration that turned him grey. It took a lot longer than anyone imagined. The initial hope was that we would clear the first lock in six weeks, but you know, with the equipment we had, that was really uh, not, not a remote possibility. It took well over a year in, in the end. The locks had been infilled up to uh, the top water level with quarry debris and then concreted over with reinforced concrete, not just concrete. We had to break this. Uh, you cut all the reinforcing bars with bolt cutters and then uh, move that slowly work our way down through something like uh, 14, 15 feet of quarry debris, which uh, using hand tools was a major undertaking. They worked on it for more than 20 years. The group we had were uh, fairly close-knit. We, we used to have social meetings at the time and you used to get pretty much the same core group coming to those as to the uh, working parties. We were all good friends, you know, and all pulling in the same direction, you know, a team, really. A restoration project that began in 1974 ended finally with the official opening in 2001. To go from closure in 1944 no one interested in, in navigating it, no pleasure boat industry or anything like that. To go from that to seeing the waterway reopen from end to end um, in 2001 was a m massive achievement. Reopening the Huddersfield Canal, the impossible restoration, was a significant achievement. But it was by no means the end of the story. These days, every weekend, up and down the country, hundreds of committed volunteers turn out, just like they've done at countless restoration projects since the 1960s. They're bringing many more canals to life, but there's still a lot to do.
Nowadays, there are more narrow boats than there were in the 19th century heyday. And upwards of 200,000 people spend their holiday on a canal. Figures that were unimaginable when the campaign to rescue the canals first began. More than 60 years on from when the canal campaigner Tom Rolt published Narrowboat, Britain's canals are still enjoying a second golden age. Britain's waterways are one area of the environment where a great deal is owed to a small number um, of significant people, many of whom are completely unknown today. Today, there are more than 20,000 people living on narrow boats. Joe and Keith Lodge are working to keep some of them warm in winter. It's a final twist that would really make Tom Rolt smile. Once again, a few people are making a living out of working the canals. Myself and my husband run the coal boat Haydar. Generally, we do from the beginning of October till the 31st of March and it's usually about a two-week turnaround. Um, we supply coal to houses, um, we do the wharf in up at Welford and all the boaters that need coal over the winter. For me it's relatively new. Um, my husband Keith has been around the water for four, over 40 years. For me, I didn't start till 2000. I love it. I absolutely adore doing this job. It's great fun. You meet lots of wonderful people. But we've all got a common theme. We all love the waterways. Joe Lodge embodies the twin forces that have shaped many people's love of the canals a respect for the traditions and skills that first created a stunning network of inland waterways and a passion for a simple life that moves at the pace of a horse. I just love the whole lifestyle. We're not in the fast pace of life anymore, which is what I enjoy. And I feel like I've come home. It's like I've come home.